Hello, I'm John Hartledge. Today, we are going to Hungary in the central part of Europe, the heart of so many stories, so much history, and the unending search for identity. Let's chat wine. Bicaver, bull's blood. Mm, so much in a name here. So bull's blood, big story, 16th century. This wine has been around for hundreds of years. So first, the name. It's from a company called Egerven or Egervine. Eger is the second largest uh, community in Hungary, it's Northeast Hungary, not far from Tokai, and we will definitely have an episode on Tokai's famous dessert wine. But Eger, the town of Eger, steeped in so much history. So wine of Eger, so Eger Wien. Then, here we go, ready? Egri, also referring to Eger, the town of Eger. Egri, Egri, Bicaver. So Bicaver is blood of the bull or the bull's blood. So this is the bull's blood of the town of Eger. Egri Bicaver. Now, famous and named after a particular assault um, on a castle or the castle of Eger. And it was a siege that the town of Eger was able to fend off. So much so that the Turks who were attacking the castle in the 1500s, so I said 16th century, ah, nice tight capsule. That also is helpful because it also keeps anything from leaking if there's any, oh, and they gave us a nice little tab. Okay, so we'll pull that open. So I'll come off nice and easy, look at that. And we could take the whole thing off, but now that it's on, it'll be attractive, good. Uh, but the uh, attacking Turks sieged the castle, the Ottomans, and the Ottoman Empire was surrounding this area and they were able to stave it off and they were drinking this red wine consistently as the Turks came to believe that they were so stubborn, this town of Eger in this castle, everybody, all the Hungarians were so stubborn that they must have bull's blood in those bottles and they must have bull's blood uh, in, their, in their veins because they're so stubborn. So that's where the name comes from. It's very, very uh, great little story, not to be confused with a very famous Spanish wine called Sangre de Toro. And the Sangre de Toro is the blood of the bull, which is was really an homage to Bacchus or the Roman god, uh, uh, Roman god, uh, actually the Greek god is Dionysus, but Bacchus, the Roman god of wine. And the Roman god of wine uh, was a little bit of a, a bull-man combo. So that was the blood of the bull, okay? So here we go, uh, nice cork. Wow, I think it's very tight grain cork. I think it, I, that looks like real cork if that's not, a polymer that really feels, it feels like cork. Good, nice and neutral. Okay, $10. So, very interesting. Uh, Hungary has traded hands so many times. This wine is based primarily, or they say anchored, in a family of uh, grapes called Kek Franco, or Kek Frankish, uh, in Austria, not far away. Uh, also influencing, think Ottoman Empire, uh, and then when the imperial history came in. But in Austria, uh, a group of wines known as Blaufrankisch, and even in some continental uh, uh, mid-Atlantic and some of the regional Midwestern United States, which tend to be a little cooler, just like this area of Hungary, uh, known as Lemberger. And sometimes Lemberger is, is produced to be a little sweeter. This is about 12% alcohol by volume. Uh, anchored with the Keck Frankish grapes, but during Soviet times, after World War II, the focus really was on volume. So they were utilizing this area. It was very good for agriculture. Let's produce as many grapes as we can. Bringing in Cabernet, Pinot Noir, Syrah, a lot of different varietals, Cabernet Franc. Now, the most hardy in the weather, 
certainly the Keck Frankish wines. Uh, Cabernet Franc is very hearty. Another grape called Zweigelt grows really easily in this area. So it's a huge combination. So now Hungary has said, you know what? Let's get back to our roots. Now that they've got their own country, we gotta have our own wine. So they're going back to their history. So we're gonna base this wine on the Keck Frankisch, okay? They have to have in their basic classic, $10 price point, uh, at least three of these 13 different grapes that are grown there. Once you get to uh, Superior, more grapes of that group have to be in there. Once you get to Grand Superior, so they have now started to produce, uh, to have a little bit of government control on how long things are fermented, how long they're aged, and that all adds to the price and the quality and the structure. And there is some, some beautiful things happening in the market uh, in Hungary. And uh, this is a real throwback to the origins of the country. Mm. So this is what I'm expecting. Bright, uh, I don't feel berry. Maybe, maybe on the tart berries, maybe you know, um, not so ripe raspberries, but cherry. This real nice acidity. Um, the uh, Hungarian uh, um, fare or cuisine tends to be very spicy. This is classic, classic structure for a wine that, uh, uh, that comes from this area, particularly because of their food. So very bright, nice cherry, good acidity, really would cut through fat for a, uh, for a beef or a, a, a steak-like textured, um, but nicely marbled meat. Really nice for stew because you get this nice little crispness in there to clean the palate and set you up for another taste. But with that acidity and that little tartness, let's do a little Bernoulli's principle. Here we go. Mm, get ready for the gurgle. And... Oh, I love that sound. Did I forget to giggle? <laughs> That's all right. Let's see. Okay, a little brighter. Actually, getting a little bit of the wood now from the oak, a little bit of oak aging. Mm. Yes, this is not a wine that you would sit down. Oh, let's just sit down with nothing and just have a sip of a beverage. No, this is food wine. This did smoothen it up, but it still has that tartness that cries for food. Cheese, beef, marbling, uh, maybe venison. You know, that little bit of gaminess would be fun Fun played with that. I gotta tell you, at the $10 price point, steeped in history, uh, just, I wouldn't say elegant, but austere. Um, it's nice in a glass and great story. Cheers, come see me again and let's chat wine.